mind bend. Non ordinary and extraordinary states of consciousness for a mind bend creative. So, you have、uh, a lot to share about your own experience with psychedelics and、uh, artist management and photography, filmmaking, everything. Just go ahead and give me a little bit of a synopsis of、uh, your life to this point and how you got to where you're at, your interest in psychedelics. So, it all started with、uh, I had bought a couple pounds of mushrooms with the intention to sell those purely to sell them to make a profit. No, no intentions, no spiritual understanding. No, you know, nothing like that. And、uh, I realized real fast that once people tried mushrooms, they don't come running back and there's not a big profit margin. So then after that, I got stuck with about a pound of them. And over a period of time, me and some, me and some buddies ate them. And,、uh, and one night, I took about, we split an ounce between two guys. And I had my first experience. It was like a spiritual experience where it was like this translucent hole in reality opened up. And this Indian goddess, who we've all seen, you've seen her paintings of her several hands, she was doing a dance like with her hands together. And the dance was so perfect rhythmically that it was like pistons in an engine. And、um, I remember walking towards this translucent hole in reality and thinking that I want to go in there. And the minute I had that thought, telepathically, this goddess let me know that if I came in there, I would die here. And as soon as I had that fear, the whole just kind of went away. You know, and that was my first spiritual experience, mystical experience with mushrooms. So, contemporarily, you manage an artist named Yellow Wolf.、You're, you come from a photography background, artist management background, but you're working closely with Yellow Wolf. And、uh, in production, touring. Tell us a little bit about your professional life. So, I used to manage a photographer named Mr. Clandestine, and I had never shot a photo before that, you know, professionally, obviously. I've taken pictures, but, and、uh, one night he had, he had been commissioned by the Tennessean to shoot an artist named Yellow Wolf at the Mercury Ballroom, right, in Nashville. And, I didn't know who that was because I knew Wolf as Coma growing up. You know, we wrote graffiti together. I wrote Alice, he wrote Coma. And、uh, we used to paint the town literally, right? And、um, we lost contact. He moved to Alabama. I moved to Delaware for a couple years. And then when the guy told me he was going to shoot Yellow Wolf, I, I started looking him up, said, okay, I'll roll with you. I didn't usually go two shoots with him. And、um, when we got there, The venue staff was making it really difficult for us to get backstage to shoot him, even though he had the passes, he was being paid to be there. And、uh, I said, Man, look, I'm not leaving until he tells me to kick rocks. I know this guy, right? We, I mean, we grew up, we were like brothers. We just lost contact, and I didn't realize this is what he was doing with his career. So、um, we ended up making our way to the back, and a couple guys who knew me from way back. So, hell yeah, come in. And Wolf just instantly treated me like family again. Like it was like we didn't miss a beat. You know, and from that point moving forward, we were just hanging, man. We were, we were really close friends. And、um, one day we were at a car wash. We stopped to, to wash his truck. And I said, Wolf, I want to work with you.、Uh, I know you're not hiring. So I said, I'll, I'll just start doing things. To prove my value. And if it adds up, it adds up. You know, you don't have to pay me anything until you feel that I'm worth paying or I feel I can no longer do it. You know, he said, okay, cool. I'll put you to work. So we started there, literally at the bottom. Take out the trash, take care of the dogs while you're on tour. I don't care what it is. I'll do anything. Before that, I had been, you know, like I said, I sold weed and had a paint company. And I was kind of trying to transition, had that studio. And when he came around, that's when I decided I wanted to be the best music business person, executive ever. I don't want to deal in the artist aspect whatsoever. Now I'm standing beside my boy. And, and I started off doing, like I said, the most simple things watching the dogs, taking out the trash, driving them around, doing whatever the hell we had to do. Then, next step, I did tour photography. You know, after I traded the Cadillac and bought the camera, right? And,、um, He hired me to do tour photography. That allowed me to make some money. 
And we're actually putting together a book called the 5150 Tour Book. It's a labor of love, so it's taken me a couple years to do because of the it's a 124-page photography book with tickets and VIP passes and all this cool stuff from the tour. I handed out a sketchbook to all the artists, you know, when they were lit after the show to sketch in and, and draw. And it's kind of like scrapbook vibes. But then I went from tour manager. I started with selling merch, moved on to, uh, to tour photographer and then tour manager. And then in 2020 in Sweden, we signed a management agreement. So I literally started from, I know you're not hiring. I'll just take out the trash and watch the dogs to now, you know, I'm his manager and together we run Slim American, which is a, is his subculture brand. It's, you know, it's huge. So that's how that all came about. So you were an advocate for Yellow Wolf as he was coming up or had been known as Coma, but you decided that you wanted to stand beside him and work with him in a administrative capacity or managerial capacity. Um, you were an advocate for him. You've been an advocate for yourself. And in healing and ceremonial spaces, we can be advocates for people around us that we might bring into a space like that or introduce to a space like that, hold space for while they're going through what they're going through. So how has the role of advocacy helped shape your, your path? That's a really good question, man. Very interesting. Um, I I feel like being someone who can sit with someone through a ceremony, it seems simple, but it's there's a lot to it. You know, a lot of a lot of um, knowing when to speak to someone and knowing when not to. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like a lot of times, I will depending on who the person is. I love to bring people to this world, right? And bring them in the way that I believe is the right way. Not saying it is the right way, but the way that I believe is the right approach, right? A ceremonial aspect of full respect. And sometimes when, you know, you don't know how someone may react, I would rather be in my right head space and just sit with them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And advocate for them yeah. throughout this experience. So depending on who it is, and I, I usually stick to just me and one other person. I don't do threes. I don't do groups. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I like to go high dose. I think things can get weird when there's more than two people, you know, but I think I deviated from the question a little bit. But It's all in the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Advocating for someone during a journey is more about, um, I don't like to use the word holding space, but you know what I mean is like, knowing when to communicate to them and knowing when to leave them alone to their yeah. own journey. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it, it, take this, we're having a conversation about something that's still fairly niche, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've had to develop a, a waking mentality that you conduct business with, you know, check into hotels with, get on airplanes with, uh, do your taxes with that is supportive, stable, Mm -hmm. Not self-destructive, um, reverential, creative. What goes into maintaining your productive, positive mentality for a moment outside of the psychedelic space, the psychedelic awareness? How do you support yourself? Uh, maybe if someone's listening to this now, they're like, okay, well, that's sort of lofty. They're talking about holding space and ceremonial spaces, but I'm still struggling to get my life together in ways that I haven't yet figured out. So. Tell us a little bit about how you maintain productivity in your own life outside the psychedelic space. Meditation is huge for me. You know, like I'm, I'm no expert at all, but just finding the silence, you know, from, from technology, from the world, from all the phone calls, you know, all the, all the busyness of day-to-day -day life. Meditation is big for me. Um, I mean, I'm, I read a lot. I like to read, you know. Um, I mean, man, just doing everything you can as a human to maintain a positive mental attitude. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and that can become difficult sometimes. Um, what is it that you put into your, do you, you put things into your body, like nutritionally, or do you do, meditation is a nutritional practice. What, what, how do you, you know, do you have like a sleeping schedule? Because you're, try, you're as, busy, right? Yeah, very busy. As I've gotten a little older, I understand. I used to say, I'll sleep when I'm dead and, you know, try to, get as much out of a day as possible. Sure. But then I realized over time that's more destructive, you know? So I, I mean, I try to get six to eight hours of sleep every night. You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. think that sleep is very important. Um, yeah. Outside of that, I mean, obviously when you can a healthy diet, that's hard for me on the move. You know what I mean? Sure. I do what I can to, to eat good, but that can be difficult. 
Do you go out on the road with with Yellow Wolf for other acts uh, on tour, tour and, and live show support? Yeah, I've played I played the role of tour manager on several tours. Uh huh. And that world can be extremely uh, destructive physically, absolutely. right? Yeah, absolutely. What, funny thing is, Wolf is an incredible. He's a, he's a chef. Like he's a really good cook. So he would make it a point to make really good stuff on the bus. You know what I mean? Mm. And he's big on eating healthy, so that helps when. The main guy on the tour is really concerned with that. You Tell know? us about Yellow Wolf and the world of music that you're in. What's the what's the style? Where's it coming from? What's it informed by? What's it looking to do? Well, he's a, uh, I mean, he's a hip hop legend, man. He's been he's been doing his thing for over a decade. Uh, about two years ago, he dropped a, a rock and roll album. Whole album is rock and roll. We recorded it here at Sunset Sounds. During the um, the protests, like literally the helicopters flying over the studio, it was, it was insanity, man. And it, it gave a lot to the energy of the project, I believe. And um, after that, now he's we're about to release two more albums, Trunk Music 4 and an album called Michael Wayne. And they're absolutely incredible. You know, they're obviously no one's heard them yet. They're unreleased. But... Um, he stays busy, man. We got a lot planned for this next year. And then, like I said, Mudmouth, the movie. That I expect, you know, things. The animation is kind of the hiccup, but if everything moves as we'd like it to, I'm thinking 2024 is when we'll release that. So we stay really busy, man, in, in, a, in a really awesome way. Are you creating your own timeline, your own rules right now, or, or do you have to operate under anybody else's uh, no, dictate? Man, we're, we completely, we we make all the decisions now that we're, you know, Slamerican is our label, and um, we're thankful to make all the, you know, creatively, Wolf does what he wants to do. You know what I mean? And in business, marketing, our team, we make all the decisions. So it's really nice to have that freedom. So when you're traveling or when you're out and about, like, is your psychedelic, is it fair to say to call it a practice or is is it, how is it incorporated into your life now? Like, what, when do you set aside time or how do you, how do you create ceremonial space for yourself? I like to go <clears throat> when, when things are how I like them to be. I mean, I would like to do a ceremony every two weeks like high dose ceremony every two, two weeks. I like to give myself time to integrate, obviously. You know, you don't want to jump back in too fast. You want to take the lessons you've learned or the ideas that you've acquired and apply them to life. You know, uh, I don't necessarily have the time right now with the busy schedule to do it as often as I would like to. But, um, you know, the day before, I like to turn the phone off, don't communicate with anybody. Do what I can to, if I haven't been eating as healthy as I'd like to, make sure that the day before I eat nice and healthy, get plenty of sleep. I have some land out in the country in Tennessee, and I like to just stay in the forest and meditate, you know, and get ready. And sometimes, you know, they say that um, you should not do that in a headspace when you're not completely comfortable, right? Like it might lead to a bad trip, mm. right? And I believe that to be true for people who are not very experienced. I think you should be careful. And I think you should be in a very good headspace when you experiment with psychedelics. But as I've grown, I use them more frequently when I'm not in a good headspace. Mm. And I feel like it helps me fight through whatever it is I'm dealing with and kind of determine some form of answer, you know? It helps me navigate the issues that I may be dealing with, mm -hmm. you know? When you talk about high dose, what exactly are you talking about for yourself? My my bottom dose, I mean, with, with the exception of, you know, taking a little bit before the day starts to be in a good mood, sub-threshold, you know, a little bit on a spoon, that type of thing, that's, that's aside from the point. But when I say high dose, I start at nine grams just to... And and this may this may be odd to a lot of people, but I prefer to get to the point to purge, right? Mm. Like like to get sick, to mm -hmm. to puke. You know what I mean? I I prefer if I don't get sick, I don't feel like I I accomplished what I came to accomplish. You know what I mean? I think there's 
something to be said about about the purge. I've done smaller doses before, like like an eighth or four grams, and climbed a mountain because you don't want to take nine grams and climb something that could potentially you could fall off of. But um, and I've noticed that the emotions and the feelings that that brings up, if I don't get that out, I bottle it up and I'm actually more angry. And and the the negative emotions that you may be um, trying to cleanse. Mm actually bottle up and become more potent, you know, so I make it a point. And it's not all about food or, or things coming up, actual physical things. Sometimes it's about the the sounds and the, you know what I mean? The, sure. The, it's yeah. like a... It's a catharsis. Exactly. It's like like energy coming up and... Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel the purge to me in my in my approach is extremely important. And the nine is just a, that's a starting point. Like when I'm on my two weeks, every two weeks regimen, I mean, I'll go up to the highest I've ever done was 20 up until this point, 20 grams. Yeah. But I mean, I like to live in a range of, you know, 12 to 14, depending on the day, the situation. I've had times like in the middle of a Tuesday night, I woke up and, uh, you know, told my fiance, it was like two in the morning. So I got to take some mushrooms. But we had work the next day. She was like, you got work tomorrow. What do you What do you mean you got to take some mushrooms? And I just had this calling, man, just some reason. It felt like someone was knocking on the door saying, you know, we got to talk. And uh, so we got up, took nine grams, and it was one of the best journeys I've ever had. You know, it, it kind of answered some questions that I needed to know the answers to. Pretty incredible how they do that. Like, I feel like they'll let you know. I've also had times when I fully prepared, was ready to go. I mean, you know, air mattress blown up, everything's set and setting set, and then just got to the point where it's time to ingest and say, you know what? Today's not the day. Hmm. You know? So it's like I think it's important to, again, some of these things we may talk about might be uh, – strange or unfamiliar to the uninitiated but it's like i'm a big believer in the spirit of the plants the spirit yeah. of the fungi there's something there yeah let's get into that let's get more into that what do you think is happening during a psilocybin trip what where what where is it what what's the message is it a message where is it coming from why is it happening what role does it play in this world that we're experiencing as human beings with the consciousness that we're used to having because these are, you know, the tagline for the show is non-ordinary and extraordinary states of consciousness, mm -hmm. where you have on one side our general typical waking consciousness where we're kind of going through the motions, having relationships, feeling, feeling, you know, in our body different ways, reacting to stimuli. This is a whole different set of rules. It's a whole different universe of experience within the already wildly fascinating experience that we're having and negotiating at all times too. So what what do you think is happening? You could talk to anybody who's using psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, ayahuasca. They all have a particular version of what the experience is like for them, right? right. So um, as best you can universally, if you could sort of sum up, what, what do you think is happening with a mushroom trip? It took me a while to feel like it was something outside of myself. You know, when you're in the middle of a trip, it can feel like that. But it took me a while to, in the, in in reality, like right now, to agree to that fact that, I mean, man, if if it's all in our head, then there's so much more to our human mind, which we know is is the case. Yeah. But, I mean, I've received messages and i'll tell you one right now is one time i had a, a spot where me and some friends had some weed growing right and um it was really crazy we took some mushrooms one night and i went into the room and it was like a hydroponic setup and the plants were all it there was no face there was no they weren't you know what i mean it, they were just plants but they had this movement about them the way the fan was blowing and I received this message, and it, it it was telepathic for sure. It wasn't said out loud or anything like that, but it was like, this has got to end immediately. I told the other guys who were, you know, a part of the situation with me, hey, man, I'm done. I'm out. They were like, you're crazy. We're going to lose this money, this and that, right? 
sure enough, we got a letter from the airport authority, right, the next day saying that they were coming to all the houses on the street to um, check out the structures and make sure it was still fit for airplanes to fly over. And it was it didn't really make sense as to why they were coming. It seemed more like a reason to come inside your house. And these guys, thankfully, they they were like, dude, I think you're crazy, but you seem passionate about it. All right, cool, let's tear it down. And we did. And they came in the house. They they gave us like, there was like a four-day window where we're planning to come this day, mm-hmm. that type thing. But I received that message on a mushroom trip 1,000%. And I didn't know why. I didn't know they were coming. I didn't know we'd receive a letter. I didn't know any of that. You know what I mean? But that really happened in real life. And that's outside of myself. I didn't. I didn't have a way to know that, no. But um, you I'll, you you attribute that to a, a consciousness or a sentience outside of yourself advising you. Yes, yeah. I do and I feel like I like to stick with one kind of mushroom, specifically golden teachers. I mean, I've definitely experimented with others and things like that, but I feel like you can and I have built a relationship with the spirit of that specific mushroom. And I feel like a grandfather, like ancient energy from that. Other mushrooms I've used, you know, uh, PEs. It's like, it's a great mushroom, in my opinion, more for microdosing because it's a fun mushroom. It's it's happy. It's it's uh, a lot of laughter. It's playful. You know, when I went really high dose with PEs, it felt more like kids tugging on my shirt. You know, like, hey, look at me. Look at the, you know what I mean? It was less ancient and like mystical. You know what I mean? But I believe, I mean, I believe in my soul, man. Like, think of all the things mycelium does under the ground. You know, people know that I don't have to tell you, you know, you know how they help the forest communicate. And it's like an internet underground, like a natural internet, you know. A unique organism on the planet. Exactly. And one of the, I believe it's one of the largest organisms on the planet is what, a mycelial network, right? Sure. And uh, I'm gonna, I believe also that like people who, do these things, there's almost like a invisible mycelia. You know what I mean? It yeah. pulls us all together. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Do you talk about this with everybody that you meet? I don't. I don't. I, I like, that's why I've been enjoying getting into this community a little more because you can you can talk about it more freely and people find interest in it. I don't do that because I think it's, it's a dangerous, uh, dangerous ground to let people think you're crazy. You know what I mean? Like, it's easy to talk about things like non-physical entities and mushrooms and, you know, and people say, man, you're crazy. You know what I mean? You think that's still the reaction from most people? If you, if you were to describe your experience of a trip, mm-hmm. they, would, they would attribute it to your being crazy? Like a, just a blanket generalization I like that? I don't know that. if literally, literally like insane, but... You know, just kind of write it off like, ah, I don't know about that, man. It's until you've experienced that, you know, not, I believe it's beyond linguistics. There's no way to put into words for someone who has never experienced that, the severity and the authenticity that you experience in that realm. You know what I mean? And I've experienced before where during the purge, I was trying to speak to my fiance and tell her what I was experiencing or seeing. And it was almost like it was so, so, um, how do I put this? Like I wasn't allowed to say it out loud. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I would gag instead of be able to speak every time. If I would say anything other than that, I wouldn't gag. You know, it was just like when it was time to try to explain these epiphanies that I was having at this moment, I couldn't speak. I would mm. gag instead. Yeah, man, it's. I think it's it's interesting that it's coming to the forefront now. There's a psychedelic renaissance. You know, a lot of people are the microdosing is becoming a big thing. The, um, you know, the help for mental health with PTSD and depression and all these things. I think it's a great segue to getting this across the finish line of legalities you know, and decriminalization. But I think it'll be interesting when we get to a point where it's also a supplement to sharpen your superpower. Like even if you're okay and you're doing great, 
you can become a better version of you constantly. You yeah, you might be able to generalize. There's there's two two schools of of, of um, outlook for implementation: the uh, the healing and then the wellness uh, supplementation, right? right. Like, um, and and they can exist together. Right. Absolutely. So, if if it's troublesome sometimes to talk about your experiences, how do you how do you wind up knowing when it's the right time to talk about your experiences or um, when you when do you see opportunities arise where it's like this is the time where I can get into this with this person or this is the network where that can really be put to use? To me, it's it's when people show interest, you know, and and also coming on things like podcasts and being able to talk with like minded folks, you know, and this this kind of opens opens the uh, conversation to be able to speak on this in a way that does seem like we're having an intelligent conversation. You know, but the the non physical entity thing for me is uh is very very real. You know, and I think you can build a relationship with these. You call them what you want to call them. I don't like to really give them a name, whether mm -hmm. it's spirits or entities. Or, I don't know what to call it, but I think it's outside of ourselves. And I think they, as you build this relationship, I believe they can guide you in life, even when you're not on the mushrooms. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah, let's talk about that more. Non-physical entities. These are tropes that come up, uh, experiences that come up for you consistently throughout your experiences now. That's right. They they um they could be uh, emblematic of a, of a of a a type of being or a type of um, entity. Um, uh, they they might change in shape or appearance or awareness or feeling. Um, but there's a sense that there's something that is around aware of you you're aware of it there's an exchange going on yeah and as as i've grown in this um understanding i don't see an actual entity as often anymore like that experience i told you about my the first, first time yeah. yeah i don't necessarily see an entity it's more about uh, it's um it's more a presence in a in a telepathic conversation mm -hmm. you know what i mean then it is i actually see something i hear about a lot of people doing dmt where they see these entities i have not come across that and um have you done dmt oh yeah yeah, yeah i've done dmt and it's more for me it's more of like my experience is like flying through what feels like you know like an apple computer ad where it's really clean white background it's like this clean white background and i'm just flying through these the only way to describe it would be like ancient futuristic hieroglyphics made of clay that are forming like transformers and I'm flying through the middle. But I haven't seen any entities. Multiple times that yeah, happens. Multiple times yeah. that happens. Yeah. yeah. But the, um, let's see. Non-physical. Non so yeah, I had an experience, man. This is This is by far the most profound experience I've ever had on mushrooms that blew my mind. And it's continues to come up in my life outside of a trip is my mother had bought me a shaman's cabinet from a museum. She lived out in the country and it was uh, Carthage, Tennessee. It's ironic, but there was this museum that they had that had like a lot of um, old artifacts and some of the stuff was specifically African tribal stuff. And I guess they were going out of business or selling the building or something like that. So they were kind of liquidating what they had. And she came across this shaman's cabinet from the Yoruba tribe, which I had never heard of before, right? And apparently it's modern day Nigeria and it goes all the way back to Egypt where they say it started, right? And um, when I left for tour in Europe, I put the mushrooms I had in this cabinet. Just, you know, I was just storing them in there. The cabinet was awesome. And uh, it's like hand carved, really beautiful cabinet. But, uh, when I got in the Uber to go to the airport, the guy driving was, uh, he was talking, really nice guy, asking me where I was going. We had the whole conversation. I said, where are you from? And he's driving. He said, uh, I'm from a place you may have heard of. And he turned around, made eye contact with me and said, Yoruba. And I was just like, wow, I've never heard of this before, right? And uh, he, said, he said something in that language, and it was, may God watch over you on your journey. And I asked him if he would say it again for me and let me record it. I said, I won't put it on the internet or anything, but I just want a record of it. 
So he did. He said it again for me. That happened. Then when I came back and took the mushrooms that were in the cabinet, I had an experience that maybe lasted three seconds, but it was as real as me and you sitting here right now. And it was, I kind of leaned back on this pillow and all of a sudden, it was like I opened my eyes, but I, my eyes were closed. But it was like I had opened my eyes and I was surrounded by what appeared to be African tribal people. And they could have been could have been in the future, it could have been in the past. Everyone had buzzed heads and tribal gear on, right? Like you could tell it was like like tribal garb. And uh the vibe that I got was I was either being born or dying. They were all supporting me and they loved me and I loved them, right? And I don't it, it was either being born or dying. I couldn't see the body that that I was in. But it was as real as right now. And since then this Yoruba thing has popped up over and over and over. I'm meeting people. I went to Cuba a couple months ago and had no idea, but down in Cuba, Yoruba is a real big deal. Like they're everywhere. You know what I mean? I met a couple of Yoruba priestesses and it's just, it's crazy how it's come up in my life. I don't know what it means. I don't know the correlation. You know, I haven't got to that point yet, but that experience, it was the most, I mean, it was like reality. It was like real life. And mm -hmm. again, it was only about three whole seconds. But yeah, it was really interesting. It was, you You weren't taking mushrooms at the time or you were? When I had the experience? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was uh -huh. on a, probably about a 12 gram dose when I did that. And I, like I said, I just came to and I was definitely on mushrooms when the experience happened. Mm. But, um, but that was a very real experience yeah it as wasn't real as like anything else yeah it wasn't yeah. like i was hallucinating entities it was like i was in a room like we are right now mm -hmm. and it was very very short-lived it wasn't a long thing you know what i mean it was it was as quick as realizing this is what's going on and it was almost like the minute that i realized how profound this felt it vanished again that's something i noticed happens like like i said when I told, I let the woman know I want to come in there. And she said, well, if you come here, you die here. The minute I felt the fear, it vanished. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I've had experiences where I went to several, in real life, I went to several temples and pyramids and, you know, from Mexico and Egypt. And I just like visiting these places. I know a lot of us do. Uh, but in a couple of my trips, it's like my mind has formulated these custom um, pyramid complexes that are almost a combination of like Chichen Itza and Giza and and I'll fly through and it feels like from a bird's perspective but with no body almost like just the wind mm -hmm. you know what I mean and it's really really beautiful and incredible it's like it's like no like you have no physical body and I felt like that there's a graduation from the physical body that's that's beautiful like some of these entities have surpassed that. You know what I mean? They don't need a physical body. How do these insights and these experiences that you've had, how might they affect another person who gets to that point, has similar experiences? Where is the integration, Edward? Like how how are these how does this rub off on the practical application of life as we usually contend with? It's made me more comfortable with the idea of death, right? There's a mystery to death because nobody comes back. You know, we've got our couple, you know, someone died for a couple minutes and came back or whatever, but we don't really know what happens. And, and going to these places and experiencing these entities helps me become more comfortable with moving past this, this reality. You know what I mean? And how does it help with integration is... I've realized the most important thing in this reality is the time we have, the difference we make, you know, happiness, love, not to get too hippied out, but, you know, just good energy, man, spreading kindness and doing what you can to make the world a better place than before you came. You know what I mean? That's, I've grown to that point. And it's a pretty, pretty crazy transformation from my background and where I came from. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Like that, you said you were self conscious about coming off too hippie ish. The idea that there's still some kind of like sappy, wimpy vulnerability about the idea of like love, empowerment through love, or um, living at that kind of value. Right. Um, wh where do you see that still? Like that. That seems like that could be a fear based mentality, right? Like where where love is 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 too too weak. Well, no, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, but. That's not how I feel. It would be more or less just I like to walk the line because these things have always been associated with hippies. And I love hippies. There's nothing wrong with a hippie. But I also think that there's an element to that that can make this harder to take serious. Sure. I'm in no way fear of expressing my love or, or time, you know, and understanding. Like, to me, the most important thing is spending the time you have with the loved ones. With your loved ones, you know, and so I guess by by saying the hippie thing, I meant more of like being careful to make sure this is taken very serious. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's is the psychedelic experience is a very serious thing. It's a it's a life changing, you know, dead serious experience that needs to be entered in and treated with the utmost respect. You know, mm -hmm. have you come up around people? who are in the throes of addiction um, and and whether that's, you know, whatever substance or whatever they're addicted to. I mean, the opioid crisis is something that's on a lot of people's minds right now, right? right. And um, when it touches you, it touches you hard. Um, have you done any independent research in, in, uh, into how psychedelics could play a part in helping break addiction and set people um, towards rehabilitation in ways that we haven't really mastered yet as a as a country i haven't done a whole lot of independent research but i've heard a lot of good things about is it ibogaine yes yeah, i haven't got a chance to experience that myself but i've heard incredible things in regards to addiction with ibogaine specifically mm -hmm. um, from from opiates that's that's right yeah yeah but with me personally i mean man when i when i used to drink all the time it was, it was a problem in my life. You know what I mean. I, I was the guy who would get into fights. I, I noticed when I when I got out of that part of my life, the fight stopped happening. The cops stopped showing up. I was like, damn, that was you know that was me. But um, it's the psychedelics that, the mushrooms specifically, that took the taste away. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't struggle with it. I'm not sober. You know what I mean? I don't have a problem any longer. Like I'm a new person. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There is no problem whatsoever. There's no taste. There's no... And I respect... Let me say this. I respect everyone's approach. This is just my my journey in the way that it's, it's helped me out. And I think it's incredible because there was a time when I would struggle with it. It was like, man, how do I... Oh, this time I'm only going to do this and I'm not going to drink this and same outcome, Right? But the mushrooms had led me to a point where I no longer have a taste. I don't struggle. I don't try. It's just a changed. I've changed. Mm -hmm. So I think I can speak on that from that perspective that it's helped me with alcohol and, and that form of addiction. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? The alcohol can be a part of something that's underneath. The alcohol is usually a response to something that's happening inside of someone, it, right. it, it, it channels something, right? Um, so that base unrest that was being mitigated or filtered through alcohol in the past, tell me about more of that, tell me more about that in you and how that's changed over time. Like, cause if you had, like if you were in fighting or you were excessive behavior on that front, like what, what was it at work there in you? That's a good question. I think, I believe in like generational trauma, right? Like I had a great childhood. Nobody nobody beat me. I don't have any crazy like childhood trauma. I've had medical issues and, you know, rough times and things like that. But I don't have anything to really attribute. Like this person did me wrong and that's why I act this way on alcohol. I think maybe, and I'm just, I'm just throwing an idea out there, not this specifically, but it could also play a role. Like my grandfather was in World War II on the front lines and he 
you know, he was one of them guys that was getting shot at and shooting back, and that messed his whole, you know, messed his head up. And I believe that those things can carry through our DNA because there's no reason why I would want to fight anybody. You know, I don't understand what the problem is or where that anger or angst is even coming from. So I, I do believe in generational trauma that we hold on to and the ability to, for lack of a better term, break that curse. Mm. You know, using these substances, ceremonies, and experiences. You know, I, I wear my grandfather's medal. They made it into a cuff. I wear that on my wrist. But it's um, I'm working to break down that that trauma that I believe. And deeper than that, things that I don't even know of, of his grandfather. and You know what I mean? And sure. Further back. But that's something that I specifically, I know of for sure. I know it changed him. It changed his religious beliefs. It changed, I mean, it changed his whole mentality. It changed how he acted towards his family. Yeah. And I believe that that has come down the line among a million other things through me. Yeah. This is one of my treasures. This is a ring that my grandfather got in World War II in the Let town they were staying in in France. Oh, wow. That's really cool. We both got something on yeah, like that. Yeah, it's one of my burial pieces for sure. Um, you know, it's a concept that we don't really learn in school. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where we learn it, um, but the concept of generational trauma, it just came up in my life yesterday with a phone call that I got from a relative that shared some things with me that kind of blew my mind mm -hmm. about my family history and stuff that had gone down that I honestly, like I'm holding inside me this morning that in ways that I am going to need to address um, but we, <laughs> does it just take finding a podcast where people are talking about it or is it just, you know, cause I think this is my thought. I think it would help people if they had an understanding that what has befallen your family mm -hmm. really does have a physiological psycho-spiritual effect on your experience of life. Right. And I just don't know where that message is being shared or where it's really being discussed adequately. Right. Of course, we ha we haven't really reconciled with discussion of the psyche or more ephemeral matters culturally very well at all. And it would help people. I, I love the way you just put that. Um, I think it would help people to understand why they feel a certain way to have a clearer understanding of that, you know? Because that's... Like I said, man, when you don't really have anything personally to attribute it, attribute it to, you have to ask yourself, where is this coming from? Yeah. You know? So I, I think that's really interesting. You spoke about being aware of a psychedelic renaissance mm -hmm. earlier. Where are you seeing <clears throat> this renaissance uh, present um, in popular culture? Or how, you know, how do you think people are... Are, are coming to this 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 world of curiosity. Let me see. Um, you know, I don't know where the Renaissance recently started. I don't I don't know how it came about. I know you know back in the '60s, how it was more open minded and it kind of started to take over society and they had to shut it down. You know, and it's it's coming back now, but. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, like, like, w like, how how do you think somebody would find out? You know, like, where is it being discussed? Like, you might run into somebody uh, that you feel like it would resonate for, and you feel like you you can talk to clearly. But like, I mean, you spend most of your time in Nashville, right? That's where you mm -hmm. live. Like, uh, have you seen any kind of like scene that's coming up, or like, are, are there any groups that are meeting? Or in um, Nashville, no, not right now. There's not really anything like that. I know I got a a friend, uh, Emilio, in Massachusetts, and they do, like, Michael Mondays. And I've been talking to Bay Staters about helping me um, with Nashville and, you know, working towards potentially decriminalizing there. You know, that, that type of thing. Yeah, I'm, yeah. There's a couple people in the town that, in our town, that are on the same page, but it's not as wide open as it is out here or, you know, Colorado that type of thing. And mm -hmm. I would like to see the scene grow, but I also want to make sure that people are properly informed, you know, one on how to, how to use these things safely. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, it is true, man. It's, you can use these and, and bad things can happen psychologically and physically. You know what I mean? So it's important to 
inform people one and um harm reduction harm reduction yeah, yeah. i mean there's a million things that you need to be taught and also you know a lot of people are doing chocolates and these different things and and i think that's cool but i think it's also really important to know the source you know like i've never taken a mushroom chocolate and that's just because i don't know anybody who makes them you know and i don't need to take i just like to eat the fruit so i don't i could put it in chocolate myself obviously but you know i'm big on knowing the source you know one for a million reasons people can put things in drugs these days and it's not safe and also with the sacramental use of these substances, it's important to know where they came from. You know, the approach that I initially had as a kid, I don't want to get mushrooms from someone who has that mentality mm. as now where I'm at in life, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I want to get yeah. them from someone, don't get me wrong, they don't have to, you know, sometimes in the past when I'd, I'd taken a stab at cultivation, I would meditate with the mycelium and go in the room and and do what I could to like laugh hysterically, right? Among the mycelium to just give it that energy, you know, so maybe it can feed it back to me when that time comes. But um, I'm big on the source, man. It's, I won't buy mushrooms from just some random drug dealer. That's, that's not my thing. Yeah. You know what I mean, like I'll sit and go without unless I find someone who, who is, uh, you know, a proper fit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's jump back into the world of uh, art and creating art and creating art product and getting out into the world. So, um, where where are you going with your with your mission in music and in film and in photography and your artistry? Like, what's how are you continuing to evolve as an artist and how how is how do you see the world evolving too with other artists? Like, where where are we going with with the pursuit of music and and film and with with, with the advent of artificial intelligence and artificial creativity <laughs> and that's, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a, that's a conversation, man. So the AI stuff, I'm, I'm just now kind of, I'm playing with a little bit of all of it because I think it's important. You know what I mean? I don't want it to get to a point where I'm out the loop. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know where it's going. I don't know where it's going, but it seems to be moving quick. Yeah. Right. But, um, as far as my journey as in, artist, photographer, manager. I mean, I just want to continue to grow. Creativity is an outlet for me. You know, I recently, uh, through Slim American, we released on 419 Bicycle Day, we released a blotter art print with, with my logo, this thing right here. And uh, it's like blotter art. Like, you know, it's I think it's like 90, 90 hits or something like that. But uh, we released that and just creativity, man. I love to be creative. The film is, I love to, to do film, to produce, to direct, but it's a very time consuming process. Yeah. You know? So, but as far as, as far as music, man, I, I really only listen to the music of the people I work with. Mm -hmm. like outside of that, I read more and listen to more audio books and I spend my time in that way, as opposed to listening to other, I almost don't listen to really anything at all. When I when I go on a journey, something I love to listen to is Led Zeppelin on repeat. Sometimes I'll keep Stairway to Heaven on for four hours. You know what I mean? It's just to like get in a vibe, crawl up in it, and live in it. If you brought mushrooms in to cultivate, and the music of Yellow Wolf was in that space, what would be imbued? with those organisms at that point, because let's talk about what's being expressed through music. You know, we had music, live music taken away from us for a couple of years, you know, and the mm -hmm. experience of going to a show and having that communal, like that's a pretty powerful alchemy in itself, right? Absolutely. So let's, let's talk about, you know, you're in this world where you're working with an artist and the artist is putting the messaging out into the world. Like, can you speak to that kind of energetic exchange and what that means for people now? Yeah, man, Wolf has a way of being really inspirational uh i don't know if you've heard have you heard any of the Mudmouth project no one of my favorite records on that project if you get a minute check it out it's incredible is it's called hillbilly einstein and it's kind of it's on the topic of like you can do anything you put your mind to you know what i mean if i was going to play anything for the mycelium i would play hillbilly einstein 
You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's got the message that you want to impart there. Yeah, it's like yeah. turn that negativity in, into creativity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's that's the moral of the story without reciting yeah. the the song. That's the moral of the story. Do you think people will continue to want to go out and have the communal experience of 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 experiencing an artist live together in person? I believe so, and I mean that that also depends on the live performance of the artist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like some artists have a more engaging performance than others. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But uh, we were actually in Europe on a the Europe uh, Ghetto Cowboy tour when COVID became a thing. We were in Cologne, Germany, and my friend Big Phil called me and said, hey, the president just got on the TV and said if anyone's traveling from outside the U.S., the borders will be closed Friday. And I was... Uh, it was my first tour that I was, first international tour that I was a tour manager on. Wow. And I had an incredible front of house guy who became like a surrogate tour manager teammate because, you know, as you know, things in Europe, things you would never expect, parking, you know, has different rules than we have here. And so I had a guy who was able to assist me in making that all kind of flow seamlessly. But um, I was in Cologne, Germany when I got the call. And everybody from the accounting firm that we had at the time was like, oh, this is a huge mistake. You can't cancel the shows. You know, it was like everybody was like, this is not, you need to stay there. You need to do this, do that. And, uh, man, it started getting a little more strange and a little more strange. And finally, I just made the decision, man. It was like we had pulled up in Paris and I slept on it. I said, man, I'm pulling the plug on the tour and we're going home. And everybody had my back in that decision. But that was a tough decision because it was a big tour. Yeah. You know what I mean? And obviously we made the right decision. Some of our friends, uh, they got stuck in Paris because they ended up staying. And that was uh, for like two months. And it was difficult because they had to get like notes from the government to to leave to buy groceries. And, you know, it, it was a thing. But uh, It continues. It all continues. Uh being an artist and and seeing the scope of what you want to do, working with people to to get the messaging across, it's a constantly evolving process, right? Right, right. And keeping yourself grounded, grateful, healthy, insightful, right. caring, empowered, like that's that's something you would wish for all of your peers, for all of your friends, right? One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a personal message, mm -hmm. um, but again, the reason why we're doing the show is to share information, to share anecdotes, candid, real experiences, um, give you the space to speak freely mm -hmm. and, and share from the heart and share from your experience. That's what anybody who comes in here has the opportunity to do. So I hope that you feel like you had a chance to get across some things that meant something to you. Absolutely. Right. No, I had a great conversation, man. A great time with you. And yeah, this has been, this has been very, very beneficial. Thanks for coming in and keep me posted on how things develop in your life with music and everything else. Man, I will. Thank you for having me. You got it. <laughs> <laughs>